And uh, I can honestly say this is a real man of God. And I know that what you bring will be straight from the throne room of God. So, Father, I thank you for Marco. And we give you, Lord, the glory, the honor, and the praise that you richly deserve. There's no one like you, Jesus. And, Father, we just pray for liberty in the Spirit, for Marco to bring the words that you wanted to bring. Father, I believe that lives will be changed, turned around for the glory of, of your, your name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Yeshua. There is no name like yours. Father, we just lift the name of Yeshua high above this, this town. And, Father God, we declare in the mighty name of Jesus that the best is yet to come. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, shalom in the wonderful name of Yeshua. Shalom to you all. Awesome worship. Thank you for that. It's a real blessing. It's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. Come, let us go up to the house of the Lord, our God, and give praises to his name. You know, we just come back recently from Israel. What a blessing that was. We were in the land of Israel one week ago. As Pete rightly said just there, it is Jewish New Year today, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. So I'm going to be looking at a little bit today, because I think it's very apt, and it's no coincidence that Tom put me on to speak today, because I've got a lot on my heart to share with you about the Feast of Trumpets. Now, some of you might remember when I spoke quite recently, I also spoke on the Feast of Trumpets, and you might say, well, you've already done that. Hey, the Word of God has got a lot of things to find out about. And when we start peeling the layers back, there's more and more to come. So I'm going to look at another part of Feast of Trumpets. So you might say, well, what happens in the Feast of Trumpets? Say you're in a Jewish community or you're in Israel. Well, the first thing they do that they'll offer to you is an apple or slice of apple to dip into honey, and then you can eat it. So it's like the sweetness of the new year. And that's great because I think that's very symbolic of Jesus, Yeshua. So we can take as believers here right now, I wish you a, a blessed and a sweet new year in the name of Yeshua. Health, healing, wholeness, preservation, prosperity in his name. Amen. Well, it's a, it's a special season really that started some time ago in the Jewish calendar. And we, we come to then to the point called Rosh Hashanah. Well, way before then, when we were in Israel, we noticed a lot of the, the Jewish faithful for instance, whether it would be in a marketplace, a train station, an airport, there were all of these tabletops full of, I don't know if you've heard of this before, the tefillin or the phylacteries. So it's, it's all the sort of the, I don't know how to describe it really, but it's one of the laws where you put the scriptures onto the arm, onto the forehead in accordance with the Mosaic law. So we saw a lot of this going on. So they would blow the shofar and the faithful would come along, put on the tefillin, say the prayer, okay, then we're all good. See, so it's all based on works. But there's a real hunger in Jewish hearts in Israel as well to find Messiah, particularly in the ultra-Orthodox. And, it, and it's a joy to pray for them as well and to share with them. You know, we had a few occasions while we were in Israel to speak to Jewish people, to speak to the ultra-Orthodox, and they need Yeshua. Praise God, they need him. So it's Jewish New Year. So... The message of Rosh Hashanah really is this. Repent, reflect on your life, look at your life so far. Does something need to change? It's time to repent now. Don't wait till it's too late and you enter the days of awe and you hit Yom Kippur because then it's too late. That's how it goes. Now, obviously, it's a bit different for us because we're now born again in the new kingdom. So we know that Jesus has taken all our sins away and we're righteous in him. But for the unbeliever or for the Jewish person still, it's all about trying to make yourself right and clean and do the right thing and follow the old laws. But as we know, that does not work. So if you've got your Bibles on you, I'm just going to read a, a scripture from the book of Leviticus. Now, like last time, it's not going to appear on the screen behind me because I didn't send the scriptures in. So we're going to have to do the old-fashioned way again and read our actual Bibles. Wow. So Leviticus chapter 23 I'm just going to read this verse out because this is the verse that's, that's to do with the Feast of Trumpets. And it says this. Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a rest. A reminder by blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. 
So this is normally a two-day feast, which starts today, by the way. So isn't that quite apt that I'm stood up here talking about it now, and I'm going to show you some more fulfillment in Jesus about this feast that I think will really bless you. So obviously, the apparatus that's quite useful is one of these. Don't know if you've seen one of those before? A few nods going on there. Do you know what this is? It's a shofar. So it's a piece of ram's horn. And this is what is blown consistently in the synagogues all through this season of the Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And there's many reasons it's blown. And afterwards, there's a little treat. Not we're going to get religious about this or anything. But we're going to have a few of us up here. Now, be kind to us because we're quite novices, aren't we, Gordon? That we're going to give a bit of a blast of the shofar. Well, Judy's the expert, but, you know, I'm just pumping it up a bit here. Um, the shofar is it's not, because some people say to me sometimes, oh, what, what are you doing all that thing for with the shofar and going on about the feasts? It's Old Testament, right? Yeah, it is. But what we need to understand is that hidden in the Old Testament is Jesus in types and shadows in all kinds of situations. So when, it, when it time you read the scripture, it doesn't matter if you're reading Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Lamentations, Leviticus, Jesus is in there. And I found recently over the last year or so myself, as I bring the communion to the church, I often do some research around one of the old offerings, burnt offering, sin offering, grain offering. Jesus is hidden in all of those offerings. And when you find it, it's, it's awesome. It really is awesome. So I'd encourage you, when you read those things, don't sort of go, oh, this is the Leviticus, how boring is that? Let's just skip a few chapters. Get stuck in. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus to you, and you will find him in a, in a more powerful way, I believe. So just to recap from last time, I mentioned the seven feasts of the Lord. Not the seven feasts of the Jews. These are the seven feasts of the Lord. And they were Pesach, or Passover, Unleavened Bread, Shavuot, Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. And then I did mention that the first four of those have already been fully fulfilled by Jesus. For instance, Passover, the Passover lamb, when the lamb was taken unblemished into the household and it was killed at the end of the week and the blood was taken and applied to the lintels and the door frames and it kept the children of Israel safe as the angel of death passed over them. So likewise with us, the blood of Jesus is the same for us in our own lives. It protects us. Then the next one was unleavened bread. On the Feast of Unleavened Bread talks all about Jesus' burial. He was buried sinless, so his body did not see decay. That's what it said in the psalm, my holy one shall not see decay. He rose bodily from the grave because he had no sin in him at all. So he now becomes the first fruits of those who have died. He began the firstborn from the dead. And we've got all that to look forward to. Hallelujah. And then, of course, Pentecost, when Jesus ascended back up into heaven, he sent the helper, the Holy Spirit, who we have now. Hallelujah. Who guides us leads us in all the ways of him. So, thinking of it like that, the next feast that Jesus is going to fulfill is this one I'm talking about today. How exciting is that? That this feast, it's happening right now, this is the next one that Jesus is going to fulfill. So, as I was thinking about this, and we talked about this on Thursday at the prayer meeting, have you noticed that how fearful people are becoming? You might have noticed that. Well, we've definitely noticed. I've noticed it at work. In general, there seems to be a real fear gripping people of what's happening in the world. I'll give you a few examples. I've written some down. The migrant problem, the roller coasters of the stock markets throughout the world, Chinese warships entering U.S. waters for the first time, a congressional vote due on the Iran deal, uh, Russian jets arriving in Damascus. Um, Today, of course, the riots on the Alaska Mosque in Jerusalem, and on and on it goes. As somebody said to me at work this week, what's it all coming to? What's the world coming to? Well, as a believer, we can answer that question. The return of the king. See, this is what's going to happen. It's hotting up more and more in the earth as we know the signs of the return of Jesus. But not for the believer. There's no fear for us who believe in Jesus there's no room for fear for us because Scripture tells us, I've not given you a spirit of timidity or fear, but power, love, 
and a sound mind. So the Lord has given you power, love, and a sound mind. So if you don't feel that you've got a sound mind right now, you declare it over yourself. Thank you, Jesus, I have a sound mind. Thank you, Jesus, I do not have a spirit of timidity or fear, but I have power and love. You can declare that over yourself. That's praying the scriptures over yourself. So you might say, okay, well, why the shofar? What, what's that got to do with it? Why, why are you blowing trumpets all the time? I don't understand. Well, the first time the shofar was really blown in scripture, you can read about it in Exodus, when children of Israel, what well, Moses was given, the law on Sinai, and it was often called the first trump, the first trumpet. And then we go on to us as believers, when we blow the shofar, it's like a declaration of God's victory over sin and death. That's something to blow the shofar about, isn't it? Amen. The next one I've written down, I think this is very important as well, the blast of the shofar is to remind you to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is an eternal city that's got an eternal destination, and it's a place where you're going to end up dwelling in the millennium reign of Jesus. So if you haven't been to Jerusalem before, you go in there one day. Hallelujah. So to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's where Jesus is going to return to very soon. Hallelujah. But the main purpose of the shofar was to call for the Redeemer, to call for Messiah. So think about that a minute. When these shofars are being blown all over Israel, on all the Jewish people, they're still calling for Jesus. They don't know who he is yet, not all of them, but they're still calling for him to come forth. Hallelujah. So if you think about it, in Genesis, we had Abraham and Isaac, and God said to Abraham, offer your firstborn son, your only son, Isaac, the line of promise. And I want you to sacrifice Isaac. So Abraham took him up the Mount Moriah. He was all bound up, ready to take his life. But the Lord stopped him. And if you remember the story, there was a ram, wasn't there, caught in the thicket, and that became the sacrifice. Well, it was like the ram became the substitute instead of Isaac. So hence the horn. So for us as believers, Yeshua, Jesus, became kind of like that ram in the thicket. He's the substitute. Instead of what we should have gone through, Jesus took the penalty. At the cross, tasted the death for us, tasted hell for us, went where we should have gone, but we don't have to when we believe in him. Hallelujah. Now often when you talk about Jesus coming, I find this a lot in the church, there seems to be a lot of confusion. People talk about, they'll quote one scripture and you'll go, hang on a minute, that's the actual second coming. Then they'll quote another scripture and you'll go, hang on a minute, no, that's the rapture. Then they'll quote another scripture and think, no, actually that's the millennium reign. And there seems to be a real mixture of how, what, what's talking about what when you read scripture. Because don't forget, when the disciples came to Jesus and said, when will your kingdom be? When will the time happen? They expected the kingdom to happen, bang, straight away, there and then. They did not know anything about the mystery of the church because they were Jews. And I think that's so wonderful that the Lord has used Paul, who was like an ultra-Orthodox Jew, to tell us all about the church and reveal the mystery of the bride of Christ. You are the bride of Christ. Did you know that? You are the bride of Christ. That's the most awesome, privileged position that we can have. So, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I'm just going to read this scripture as well if you've got your Bible. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. This verse describes the rapture, the snatching away of you, the body, the bride of Christ, the church. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud cry of summons, with a shout of an archangel, and with the blast of the trumpet of God. And those who have departed this life in Christ will rise first. That's the rapture. Jesus is coming back for his bride. You are the bride. There will be a loud shout. The trumpet will sound. We're out of here. That's the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. Isn't that exciting? Wow. So, the shofar blast on Rosh Hashanah, there's many different things it's going to fulfill. It's often called the last trump, the last trumpet. The last time the trump sounds, the church is snatched away. And on this day as well, 
What do we find happen in heaven? The coronation, the coronation of Jesus as king over all the earth. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 5. Jesus is crowned king and you'll be there. Am I painting a good picture here? I think so. So today I want to explore another part of the Feast of Trumpets to encourage the church. This is what I believe the Lord has asked me to do, to bring this word because there's a lot of fear still in the church and we need to go out of here blessed, encouraged, motivated, and understand the word more. So, anybody want to be encouraged this evening? Well, I do. Um, you see, the thing is, a lot of people don't realize, when you stood up here, you encourage yourself. Peter will know this and other people who speak. You know, you bring the word, and I'm building myself up as I'm speaking. So, even if nobody else is getting anything out of it, I am. But this is the word of the Lord, so I know you're being built up. Now then, the Bible... When we look at the Bible, I want to look at it in a different way tonight. And I want to remind you that tonight, the Bible, right, it's a marriage covenant. Have you ever thought of that before? A marriage covenant? A few shakes, a few few nods there. What I want to share with you tonight, something from the Feast of Trumpets, that is a marriage covenant. You might say, well, between who? Well, between God himself through Jesus and you. A marriage covenant. Wow, that's interesting. Now, I want to say this as well, that both the Old and the New Covenants, or Old and New Testament, are describing how God the Father, through Jesus' Son, who is the bridegroom, is in the process of marrying his bride. Do you understand that? So, at the moment, it's not a final deal yet. We're still on the way with this one. But we are being married. We're in a marriage covenant with the Lord Jesus. And that's going to have still got time still to, into his whole fullness yet. So, and we will live and dwell with him forever. Amen. The best is yet to come. You know when people say that to you all the time, the best is yet to come? Well, it is. You see, Jesus came into this world to destroy the works of the devil. That's what he says in Scripture. He came into this world to destroy the works of the devil, and he came for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that who should ever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, life with the Lord Jesus for all time. And if you look at the world today and all the fear that's gripping people, the only safe place to be is with Jesus in the cross. It's a little bit like when Peter talked about in those end days, it'll be a bit like before the Noah's flood thing. People will be marrying, partying, carrying on, whatever right up until that last moment when the door was shut, bang, and then it was finished. No more chances. But the word is really, the only safe place to be is in the kingdom, nowhere else. So, let's have a little look what we can say about this. So, a marriage covenant. So, it's interesting, if we look at the concept of the Jewish marriage, which a lot of it comes out of Scripture, obviously, I want to draw some parallels out for you, which I think are quite exciting, about the Feast of Trumpets. And the first one is selection of a bride. So God needed to select a bride. That's normally done by the father of the bridegroom. So I'll give you an example. In Genesis, when Abraham needed a wife for his son Isaac, he didn't want him to go off the rails because he was the heir. He was the heir to the promises of God. So he wanted his best servant of all to go on a journey, find the right wife, the right wife for Isaac, so that everything was right. So believers in Jesus, us as believers in Jesus, are chosen by God. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, and it says in John 15, you didn't choose me, I chose you to bear much fruit. Hallelujah. So you've been selected Selection of the bride. The next one, the bride price is established. So there's a price involved here as well. So the bride is selected, now a price has to be paid. Now, if we think about this for ourselves, Jesus paid the highest price of all, did he not? He paid with his own life. He shed his blood for us. In Matthew 26, 39, do you remember when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he said he sweated drops of blood for us as he could see the agony of what was facing him? He was looking at what was going to come next because he knew the price was high. And it's as if he was saying, Father, 
you have chosen this bride, I've agreed to the terms, but do you realize the price that's been asked for her, for the bride? Well, yeah, the father did know, and Jesus did know as well, but he still came, hallelujah, he still came for us, he paid the price. And in 1 Peter, it talks about how we have been redeemed, not from corruptible things like silver or gold, but by the precious blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. We've been redeemed by his blood. Then it gets more interesting. The bride and groom are then betrothed to each other. Okay? So that's the first stage of marriage, and I've got a Hebrew word for you here called kidusin. The first stage of marriage called kidusin. So this is like a legally binding situation where the bride and groom are legally bound together, although they're not physically living together, okay, because Jesus is not physically with us yet. He's in our hearts. That is true. But we're not tabernacling with him yet. So when you accept Jesus into your heart, you become betrothed to him while you're still living on the earth. Do you understand that? So we're, still, we're betrothed. You've accepted Jesus into your heart. You're betrothed to Jesus. Hallelujah. And then we'll draw up a document that sorts out what's actually going to be in the marriage contract. And that's called the Ketuba. The Ketuba. So I'm still working on my Hebrew. I'm early days yet. I'm only on the alphabet, so you know, be gentle with me. Ketuba. Now, this states a lot of different things. First of all, it talks about the price that was paid for the bride. So this was a big price. It talks about the promises that the groom, the bridegroom, is going to come forth with, the promises of the groom. And it's also going to talk about the rights of you, that you have, the bride, your rights as well. So for us as believers, where do we find this, this marriage contract then? Here it is. This is the marriage contract. So all your rights and the bridegroom's promises are in here. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in him, that's Jesus, are yes, and in him are men, to the glory of God through us. All the promises for us believers in Jesus are legally ours. So, you're struggling with the situation? Find the promise in the word. Stand on the promise. That's the bridegroom's promise and your rights. Amen. Now then, this, this is interesting as well because you've got to do something about it. We can't just sit and do nothing. We, as the bride, okay, if you want to become part of the bride, what does a bride normally have to do? Well, open her mouth and say something. Give her consent. Okay? You've got to say yes or no. And when God betrothed himself to Israel in the early days, the children of Israel, when they were at Mount Sinai with Moses in the wilderness, all the people said to him with one voice, we do. We will follow you, Lord. We do. We do accept this. So they responded. And likewise, we have to respond to the invite. When Jesus comes knocking on the door of your heart, you've got to say, I do. Because he's not going to pressurize you. And then I'm going to read from Romans 10 now, because I just want to show you this important scripture. So Romans chapter 10. It's hard to do that with one hand. You see, when you've got the mic in this hand, as Judy knows, it's, you get a bit sort of clumsy. So it's Romans chapter 10. I'm starting at verse 8. So it's very well-known verses. Okay, so here we go. Romans chapter 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Well-known passages of scripture that I'm sure you first heard when you became born again. So to follow and accept Jesus, the bride's got to say, I do. So the next, if you say, I do, what would have happened next in the marriage situation? Well, there'd be some exchange of a gift. 
probably a ring. That's normally the situation that happens. So the groom gives a value to the bride and she accepts it. So the ring normally then indicates that the betrothal is complete. So the ring goes on the finger, the situation is done. Well, if we think of us as believers, God did not give us a ring, but he gave us the Holy Spirit, didn't he? The Holy Spirit, I promise, he went back to the Father. He says, wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And now we have the Holy Spirit. We have the gifts of faith, righteousness, grace, loving kindness. We have the gifts of the Spirit, speaking in tongues, prophecy, words of knowledge, healing, all of these gifts from the Holy Spirit that he gives to us. And then as well, I like this next bit, the cup of covenant was shared between the bride and the bridegroom, a cup of wine, to indicate a covenant between the two. Wow, I'm sure we can understand the parallel for us as the bride. Jesus stood up at the Last Supper and took the third cup, called the cup of redemption. They were following the Passover meal, don't forget. He lifted up the cup of redemption and said, I'm going to make a new covenant with this one in my own blood. This cup changes. It will be my blood now. And that is what we take when we take communion. We take the reminder of Jesus' blood that has redeemed us from all sin and everything completely. So the bride and the bridegroom share that cup of covenant as we do when we take communion. Hallelujah. The bride then has this kind of, I've got another Hebrew word here. The bride then has a, what we call a, a mikvah, a water immersion, kind of like a ritual cleaning that they do in the Jewish marriage situation. So it's an act of purification by immersion, kind of like a spiritual rebirth for her. So go into the water, out of the water again, spiritually reborn, and that's how it's recognized. So if you think about this, a spiritual reborn, with a bride, we've gone through a ritual cleaning. Believers in Jesus, been baptized in water. We go under the water, we come up symbolically in our new life. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, remember, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We become born again, new creations in him. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Hallelujah. Now this is when it gets a little bit more exciting, the next bit. What happens next is the groom departs and he goes back to his father's house to prepare the bridal chamber, the bridal house, where they're going to live. So it's the groom's duty to leave. Goes back to the father's house, gets to work on building the new house, bridal chamber, etc. But before he goes, he makes a statement. Doesn't just leave and that's it. Oh, I wonder if he's coming back. Oh, maybe not. Never mind. No. This is what he says. I go to repair a place for you. If I go... I will return again unto you. Hmm, that sounds familiar from John chapter 14. Do you remember when Jesus spoke to his disciples about not being fearful and worried? He says, you know, if I leave, I'm not just gone, I'm coming back. And if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And once I've done that, I'm coming back for you. That's what he said. I just love that parallel going on there. So, the bride is then set apart for a period of time while the groom is away. That's the church right now. The church right now is set apart for such a time as this where the bridegroom, Jesus, is away. We're waiting eagerly for his return, are we not? At any moment, any time. Now then, the, groom, the bridegroom's father has to be satisfied that all is prepared before the bridegroom can come back for the bride. So the bridegroom has been busy working on the bridal chamber, making the house, getting all the preparations ready, so everything's just right. So the bridegroom's father will come along and see everything's okay. Ah, we haven't got this bit ready yet. This hasn't happened yet, etc. So he's not quite ready to come back yet. But when everything's right and the time is right, the father will turn to Jesus and say, go get your bride, go get your bride. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? Go get your bride. And the groom does not know when that is. Only the father knows. That's what Jesus said, isn't it? No man knows the hour. Not even myself. Only my father knows the time. 
But you know, this is what I was thinking about. Nothing happens in the Bible by chance. You know, there's a place name, a person, a situation that happens. It's, there's no coincidences. Everything's for a reason. And I love the symmetry in the feasts as well, the feast of the Lord, how everything, if you start peeling the layers back, it is incredible. And you start to see the picture of when Jesus returns at the Feast of Trumpets, hallelujah, which we're entering into today. So, you know, make no mistake about it, church, Jesus is on the threshold. He's coming back imminently. But when I say coming back, I mean to snatch you away, to take you into heaven, to the bridal chamber. When I say coming back, I don't mean the second coming to the Mount of Olives. That is still future. So the bride, that's us, we're waiting eagerly for our groom, are we not? Are you not waiting eagerly for the trumpet sound when you're out of here? You know, I joked last time that some people might say, oh, do me a favor, I don't want the rapture to happen for a bit. You know, I've just started this university course. Oh, I've got a new job, or I've just got married, or I'm going to New York next year. Come on, leave the rapture for a bit, will you? I don't think so. When that trumpet sounds and we're out of here, you will be in the most perfect place ever because when you see Jesus, you'll be like him. Hallelujah. Now then, the next part, the groom's still got to return, so let's go on to that. The groom returns with the shout and the sound of the shofar. Wow, that's interesting. He usually returns about midnight. You might say, wow, that's a bizarre time to come back, isn't it? That's the deal. He normally comes around midnight when it's late. And his return is part of the fulfillment of this biblical feast. What happens next? So now we're with Jesus. We get married. There's a marriage ceremony. Now, if you know anything about Jewish marriages, you might picture the scene. There's like a canopy. And they stand under the canopy. Um, the word is chupa, chupa. So I'm still working on my Hebrew, getting there. It's like a canopy. Well, when we're in heaven with Jesus, heaven itself will be like the canopy. And this is where we'll get married. It takes place in heaven. The marriage takes place in heaven and the time in the bridal chamber when the marriage is consummated with Jesus in heaven. Now, it's an interesting bit here because it talks about a seven-day period, but the seven-day word is shav shavuah which can mean days, or it can mean years, which is quite interesting. And as I thought about that, that could well relate to the time back on earth, because when the bride has been raptured away to heaven, this earth will go through a period of seven years called tribulation, or Jacob's troubles, or the birth pangs of Messiah. They all mean the same thing. So when you're raptured away, this earth will go through another seven years of tribulation before Jesus physically returns back to the Mount of Olives with you for his millennium reign from Jerusalem. Hallelujah. So while tribulation is going on here, we're with Messiah in the marriage. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. After this period of time, you might have heard of this, the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is what happens next. So, during that consummation period, Jesus is crowned king of all the earth. And we're there with him, the bride of Christ, ready to rule and reign with him. After that seven-year period, we, turn, we return with Jesus to the place he promised he would return to, the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, to set up his millennium reign. He will come back to rescue his people, Israel, because he does not forget his covenant promises with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he will come back when the world has surrounded Israel, and he will defeat the armies that have come against them, subdue them, and then we will reign with him, hallelujah, from Jerusalem. It does not blow your mind. Isn't that incredible? That's still to come. Hallelujah. So the marriage supper will then take place, and then we will rule and reign with Jesus during his millennium reign. And the wedding supper then becomes the theme of the final feast called Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, when we will tabernacle with Messiah Jesus forever, for the eternity of eternities. So that's the final uh, feast that happens late September, Sukkot. Remember the name? Because that's to do with the wedding supper of the Lamb and our time 
in the eternities to dwell with him. So when you hear the gospel, remember that it's, it is the too good to be true news, that is, that is right. But it's also, it's a wedding proposal. It's a wedding proposal by God to you to accept him and be part of his bride. Now, I believe there are people watching this on the YouTube right now who are thinking, wow, I've never heard anything like that before. But at the minute, I don't think I'm part of this bride, but I want to be. Well, God is holding out the wedding invitation to you. He's showing you all that his son has already done. And he's saying, will you be part of the bride? And he's asking you. Because it's God's heart's desire that we accept that and say, I do. I do accept what you've done for me, Jesus. I accept it all. Well, I think there are people here, maybe even tonight, who maybe you're not 100% sure that you're in this marriage covenant relationship with Yeshua, with Jesus. And let's make no mistake about it, the time is coming soon when the shofar will sound and the bride is snatched away. And we want to be involved with Jesus. We want to be where Jesus is. We want to be involved in the things of Jesus. That's where our heart is. So if God is stirring your heart tonight, I want to give you a chance to respond. Because when the gospel is preached, the Holy Spirit will convict people and it's the signs and wonders will follow the preaching of the gospel. So, what I want us to do, if you're watching this YouTube as well, or if you're sat here tonight, I want us just to bow our heads right now. And I'm just going to read this out. And if you want to say yes tonight to Jesus and you want to become part of the bride of Christ, I want you can either repeat this after me aloud, you can repeat it quietly in your heart. Doesn't matter. The Lord sees your heart right now. So let's just bow our heads. Father, I want to respond to your wedding proposal. And I want to say, I do to all that you have provided for me. I am truly sorry for all my sins. And I thank you that the blood of Jesus has washed me clean and brought me into your kingdom. I believe, Jesus, that you died for me. And now I become part of your bride. As I ask you into it, into my heart right now. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You know, if you just said that prayer on YouTube or you just said it in your heart right now quietly, then praise God. You're part of his bride. Hallelujah. You have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And you are a new creation. Hallelujah. So when you hear that shofar sound, you're out of here. You're with Jesus for the eternity of the eternities. Isn't that awesome? Just picture the scene. You're with Jesus forever. The most incredible sign. When Jesus gets crowned king of the earth, you're with him in Jerusalem, reigning with him for a thousand years. No more sickness, no more death, no more pain. You'll have jobs to do in the new kingdom. Hallelujah. Be awesome. So what I want to do now is just a little extra is to invite up the Victory Church show fast blowers. Now, it's just a joke. You know, you have to be a bit kind here because Gordon and I have only been doing it for a little while. Judy's a little bit better because she's a bit more practice. See, I'm already playing myself down. But all we're going to do is just try and blow the show far a little bit for you to remind you that you're hearing God's victory over sin and death. We remind you that we're calling out that Jesus is coming soon. Yeah, because this is the Feast of Trumpets. And Jesus is coming soon. So as a believer, remember what Jesus has said when he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. That actually meant, I will never, never, ever, ever leave you or leave you destitute, ever. I will never leave you. Hallelujah. You know, last year I was on mission in Mongolia. And we're out and about in the middle of nowhere. And we had this worship time in, in the church. And suddenly I didn't realize somebody had a shofar behind me. And they let rip with it. And I tell you, it was so powerful. It really was. So, be blessed, church. I just want to remind you tonight that Jesus is coming soon. And, you know, 
You might say, well, it's all very well talking all like that, Marco, but I've got to go back to my normal life with my health problems or my difficulties in my life and everything else. Well, you know what? Jesus is interested in the difficulties in your life, and he wants to be involved in them, and he wants you to involve him in those as well. So, Father, I just thank you right now for the bride of Christ, your bride, Jesus, that sat before me right now. I thank you, Jesus, that you did it all for us, that you are our bridegroom, that you have given us everything we need for this life. Hallelujah. You have forgiven us of all sins. You've healed us. You've blessed us. You've prospered us. And you're taking us to a new level in you. Thank you, Jesus, that you want to take us to new heights in you. And we just want to give you all the glory. On the day of the Feast of Trumpets, we acknowledge right now, Jesus, that you are King of Kings, Lord of Lords, King of the universe, our soon-coming King. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Amen.